Hi everyone, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles. The series of books and videos on American history is seen through the lives of the presidents of the United States. This episode is from the life of Grover Cleveland, and the focus is marriage and economics. The year is 1885, and the Cleveland administration is underway, and it is tough going. He is a reformer, civil service reform, government ride reform. This was not going to be easy. He was facing resistance, but still, he was plowing forward. This is what he signed up for. This is what he always did, so he would be unrelenting, even though it was a very difficult time. Fortunately, he had something going for him, not on the professional side of life, but on the personal side of life. Grover Cleveland had known Frances Folsom since the day she was born. She was born the name Frank Folsom, but she went by the more feminine Frances. And Frances Folsom was the daughter of Oscar Folsom. Oscar Folsom was the former law partner of Grover Cleveland and very, very close friend who had died tragically in a carriage accident about 10 years before. And at the time, Cleveland was close to the family, uh, Oscar's wife, Emma, and the daughter, Frances, who was 11 years old at the time. In fact, the courts asked Cleveland to stand in as her temporary guardian while she was still in her youth. She would call him Uncle Cleve. Well, over time, uh, Cleveland stayed close with the family as Francis would matriculate from Central High School in Buffalo to Wells College in nearby Aurora, New York. But when she went to college, the nature and tone of their letters started to change a bit. Grover Cleveland, who's now the governor of New York at the time, actually started sending her gifts as well, occasionally flowers. He even sent her a puppy on one occasion. Now, he's a very public figure, but this was all done very much in private. Cleveland comes, becomes the president of the United States. Emma and Francis Folsom come to visit right after he is sworn into office. They stay for about 10 days. Francis then goes back to college. Last couple of months, she graduate, graduates from Wells in the spring of 1885. And what happens next? In August of that year, Grover Cleveland writes Francis Folsom a letter and he proposes marriage. In the letter, she accepts right then and there. They continue to keep it quiet until the story broke the following spring by the New York Herald. While the Folsoms were off in Europe, the story comes out. They come back at the end of May of 1886. Cleveland announces the engagement and they get married the following week and they do it in the White House. That was not the original venue they wanted, but frankly, they wanted privacy. They wanted a small affair. There were only 30 people who were invited including Cleveland's good friends, Daniel Lamont and Shan Bissell, members of the cabinet and their wives, some family members, his older brother, William, officiated, but they wanted a small event. And so that's why they picked the White House. He's the only president ever to be married in the White House. Grover Cleveland, 49 years old at the time and president of the United States. Frances Cleveland is 21 years old at the time, a couple of months out of college. She is now the first lady of the United States, although Cleveland preferred the term the president's lady. She was young, she was beautiful, she was charming. She brightened every room, every mood. She was a real asset to her husband, politically, socially, and he was sort of a new man. He was in a better mood, had much more energy when, when they were together. Now, some would criticize them for the age difference, but this was frankly never a problem for the two of them. The 22 years they spent together could arguably be called the happiest marriage of any president in history. This worked out almost to perfection. And the country could not get enough of Frances Cleveland, the new first lady. They were, the press was everywhere trying to take her picture and tell the story. And frankly, they wanted some privacy. And so they got another home, a second home, about three miles from the White House, just north of Georgetown. It was called Oakview, but everybody called it Red Top after Cleveland had the roof painted uh, red. So Red Top, Oakview, whatever you call it, that was their getaway. They had lots of animals there, plenty of good times. Francis Cleveland also brought some animals into the White House, songbirds, more things to brighten the mood. The chief usher of the White House, Erwin Ike Hoover, said that no more brilliant and affable lady than Mrs. Cleveland has ever graced the portals of this old mansion. Her very presence threw an air of beauty on the entire surroundings, whatever the occasion or the company. This is working out really well, personally and professionally for Grover Cleveland, a lot more social events in the White House now as well. Well, he needed this in his 
professional life because the professional life was still really hard. We're going to talk about some of these things in terms of pensions, the currency, and the tariff. Let's start with the pensions. Republican presidents in the post-Civil War had been signing bills into law to increasingly make it easier and easier for Civil War veterans to get on the rolls of a military pension, to the point where Rutherford Hayes, a couple of presidents ago, had signed into law the Arrears of Pensions Act. What did this mean? Two things. Number one, almost any injury that you suffer today, if you could trace it back to something that happened to you in the Civil War, you could apply for a pension. And number two, you would get back pay for the years that you were not on the pension rolls. Well, this was a strong incentive. Thousands of applications were coming in, about 10,000 a month were, were pouring into the Pension Bureau, and some were frankly fraudulent. And the Pension Bureau had to go through these one by one, and they approved the majority, but they said no to some. But Congress put a back door in this because pensions were popular. That's why they continue to pass these laws. And they said if the Pension Bureau and the executive branch turned down an application, that the applicant could actually come to Congress and a congressman could put forward an individual bill to approve that pension application. And the only person who then could say no would be the president via a veto. Well, Grover Cleveland took all this very seriously. He was never going to be a rubber stamp on anything. And so he and Lamont were up every hour of the night, seemingly going through all of these things. And again, while he approved the majority, he took out his veto pen plenty when there was clearly fraud. And we give several examples of these in the books. As he turned into being the veto mayor of Buffalo to the veto governor of New York, now he became the veto president. He issued more vetoes in his two terms in office than any other two-term president. In fact, any other president other than Franklin Roosevelt, who had three plus terms in office. 414 vetoes in his first term alone, if you include pocket vetoes, and only two of them were overturned by Congress. So this was a very powerful weapon in his arsenal. And a majority of these vetoes were related to these pensions that he just found were inappropriate at times. He made the statement that we're dealing with pensions, not with gratuities. This is not just a handout to folks. They really had to earn it. He had to protect the public purse. Didn't make him very popular with veterans groups, but they didn't like him much anyway, see, since he had not served into the war, and he tended not to care what other people thought. If this was the right thing to do, he was going to do it. Another veto, similar kind of example, where he was saying, what's the role of the federal government? And even for a good cause, he's not going to bend that rule. This was called the Seed Bill, which Congress passed in the wake of a devastating drought in the state of Texas. It gave farmers $10,000 to buy seed to save their business. Cleveland was sympathetic, but he simply said that's not the role of the federal government as he saw it, so he vetoed it. And in his message, he said, I can find no warrant for such an appropriation in the Constitution. And I do not believe that the power and duty of the general government ought to be extended to the relief of individual suffering, which is in no manner properly related to the public service or benefit. The lesson should be constantly enforced that though the people support the government, the government should not support the people. Interesting thought at the time. Very very conservative view on terms of the role of the federal government, but that's what Grover Cleveland believed, and a number of his vetoes were along these lines. Now, let's get to those next couple of topics in the economy, the currency and the tariff. Now, these are fairly arcane topics, but they're really important topics during the era of Grover Cleveland. Nowadays, we don't really think about it, the currency nearly as much. When Richard Nixon took the United States off the gold standard some 50 years ago, this idea of having a vault for the treasury with hard currency, specie, with gold, actually in that vault, in case people wanted to get paid for their debts, they could turn in their, their debt obligations and the government would pay them in gold right out of that vault. We don't do that anymore, but it was done and that's the way the federal government operated economically back during the late 19th century. Most presidents, in fact, all the post-war presidents, uh, post-Civil War presidents believed in this gold standard because it was stability for the United States in trade across the world. Gold was the, the worldwide currency and it was the stable currency where a dollar in gold in the United States or anywhere in the United States equaled a dollar anywhere else in the world. 
But some folks were increasingly wanting to introduce silver into the currency mix to go with a bimetallism approach. Now, why would they want to do that? Silver to gold, it was 16 ounces of silver to one ounce of gold. But that was not a stable ratio because the value of silver was fluctuating considerably, in particular because of the new wealth or the new amounts of silver that were pouring into the country thanks to a law that was passed over Rutherford Hayes' veto back in the 1870s the Bland-Allison Act. That act required the federal government to purchase at least $2 million in silver every month and turn it into currency. So a lot more silver coming into the market. That was devaluing silver. Why did people, some people like this? Because it was anathema to the government and to the lenders who wanted a dollar for a dollar. It was the debtor class, and this crossed party lines. These were farmers, these were borrowers, particularly in the South and the West. They wanted silver, but here's the reason. They could borrow a dollar in gold from either the government or from a lender, but their silver value would actually go down relative to gold and they could pay it back in a silver coin and actually they would get a discount on their debt, maybe only 90 cents on the dollar or 80 cents on the dollar. The money men in the East and the government very much against this because they felt like they were not living up, to, the borrowers were not living up to their obligations. And if the United States ever started uh, paying off its debts in silver, well, maybe nobody would deal with the United States because in effect, they were dealing with a discount on the actual value that they had originally borrowed. So this was controversial, it was complicated, and was very sectional in nature, but this push for things like the Bland-Allison Act to buy that silver continued to get into Congress. It was becoming increasingly popular. For Grover Cleveland, he needed that Land Allison bill to be repealed. Number one, he didn't believe in the silver idea of currency. And number two, all the gold in the federal treasury was being used month after month to buy more silver. The amount of gold in the vault was getting perilously low to the statutory level of $100 million. That was the safety valve. If you went under that, it was a question of whether or not at a given point, the United States would actually be able to pay off its debts in gold. So this was the crisis at hand on the currency situation for Grover Cleveland. The problem was when he went to the Congress to try to work out a repeal of the Bland-Allison Act, he shot himself in the foot. He basically took himself out of the game when he made the statement that uh, I believe that this is an executive office. And I deem it important that the country should be reminded of it. I have certain executive duties to perform. When that is done, my responsibility ends. Those couple of sentences effectively took Cleveland out of the game. He was trying to be conservative, respect separation of powers. But what he did was he lost the ability to influence legislation when he made that simple comment. And frankly, some of his supporters in Congress were really upset about this. One of them said, if only Mr. Cleveland had been content to say nothing. He had the game in his own hands. The opposition to his policy was melting away like snow in a thaw. He need not have done anything if only he had said nothing. It makes me sad, for what he so needlessly said is a direct invitation to confusion and discord, and the party that might have supported him, even though this was more of a sectional issue, really decided not to, and the move to repeal Bland Allison, frankly, didn't even get out of the House of Representatives. This would not be a topic that would go away, but it was gone for now, early in the administration of Cleveland. So let's shift to the tariff. This was the other major economic issue, and the tariff was the principal source of revenue for the U.S federal government. There was no income tax at the time. It was a tax on imports, the tariff that funded the majority of the federal government. And this had been controversial also on a sectional basis, more so than a party basis, for, for decades, dating back to the nullification crisis between South Carolina and President Andrew Jackson back in the 1820s. Because again, sectional interest prevailed here. If you were a raw goods material person or a farmer, you wanted low tariffs because you wanted to be able to compete internationally with, with other countries and selling your raw goods. If you were a manufacturer, you wanted high tariffs because you wanted what was called protection. Put a tax on those finished goods coming in from other countries. That makes it non-competitive with your domestic finished goods. People are gonna buy your stuff. And so not only does this perhaps put funding in the federal coffers, it keeps the domestic uh, consumer buying domestic products 
through that form of protection on the tariff. So sectionally and based on your economic stand, if you're a manufacturer, you want a high tariff. If you are into raw materials, if you're a farmer, again, typically more in the South and the West, you wanted a low tariff. Grover Cleveland wanted a low tariff, principally because he was never really a fan of protection, but he was also worried that there was unproductive cash in the treasury vaults. They had been running surpluses in the order of $100 million per year over the last several years. Chester Arthur's administration had tried to get the tariff down, but the Congress had whittled away what his commission had recommended, and it came down only by a couple of percent, and Cleveland wanted to go at it again. He worked with the chair of the Ways and Means Committee, William Morrison, on a bill, but frankly, the fact that he had taken himself out of this from that earlier statement in terms of influencing legislation, Cleveland didn't have enough push. It didn't even get out of the House. But in this case, he wasn't done. Grover Cleveland decided to do something that no president had done in nearly 100 years of the presidency. The Constitution requires the president send an annual message to Congress. We now call it the State of the Union Address. And for 100 years, that had been typically a printed report. A few of the early ones were oral, but mostly it was a printed report, and it covered every aspect of the federal government but not Grover Cleveland in 1887. He decided to take the bold move and make his entire message about the tariff, about the need to bring the tariff down. And he was advised against this. This was heading into an election year. Why put all your eggs in that basket? But Grover Cleveland simply responded, what is the use of being elected or reelected unless you stand for something? And he stood for getting the tariff down. He told Congress in this message that only such deduction as may be his share toward the careful and economical maintenance of the government, which protects him, it is plain that the exaction of more than this is indefensible extortion and a culpable be betrayal of American fairness and justice. The wrong inflicted upon those who bear the burden of national taxation, like other wrongs, multiplies a brood of evil consequences. Taking all this money putting it in the treasury vaults, that's no way to run a country. Let's bring those rates down, put more money in the pockets of the American people. But he went further. He went after specific tariffs. He wanted the reductions to come on what were called necessities, sugar, coffee, clothing, the things that everyday people buy. These things should be made cheaper and they could do, be do so by bringing down the tariff on those particular areas. So Cleveland now working with the new chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, Roger Mills, this is later in his term, and they pushed hard for the Democrats to fall in line and they got approval in the House. Went to the Senate, didn't have the same traction in the Senate. Tariff reduction would not pass on Grover Cleveland's watch here in the first term, but he was still proud of the fight. Grover Cleveland said temporary defeat brings no discouragement. It only proves the stubbornness of the forces of combined selfishness and discloses how the people have been led astray and how great is the necessity of redoubled efforts. He was not going to give in on this, but it was going to be a key issue coming up because the election was right around the corner. And that's the story for another day. That's Grover Cleveland and marriage and economics from the life of Grover Cleveland. For more Presidential Chronicles, check out my books on Amazon.com and don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm David Fisher and this is Presidential Chronicles.